So welcome. We are very excited to see you. This is Talking Data Equity. And my name is Heather Krause. I'm coming to you today from Toronto. And Talking Data Equity is an informal community gathering that we all count holds on Fridays at noon Toronto time. And we all count is an organization that is devoted to building tools and collaborating with practitioners and anyone who is working to embed equity in the data projects that they are working on. And one of my favorite things <laughs> that We All Count does is this Friday gathering called Talking Data Equity, where it's we get together and we talk about uh, in a practical uh, way with as little bullshit as possible uh, about what's working, what tools are working, what ideas are working, uh, how we're thinking of innovative, creative, and concrete ways to kind of um, have ever-increasing success in aligning the work that we're doing with the equity goals of that work. And sometimes on Fridays, we have topics that we get together and discuss, and sometimes we have special guests, and today we have a special guest, and it's a highly requested special guest. Um, we have Dr. Louisa Burrell, and uh, Dr. Burrell is coming to us today from New York City, and she is a professor at the City University of New York, and the work that Dr. Burrell does thinks deeply about the collection and the analysis and the meaning making of data on um, a population that has a specific ethnicity. And I'm not going to characterize it beyond that because that's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, Dr. Burrell also does so much work with um, mentoring students and young professionals. Um, they have a long history of really uh, useful and equitable practice in the field. So it is with tremendous gratitude um, that I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burrell now. And Dr. Burrell is going to uh, share a little bit to kind of ground us in their work and frame the situation. The um, slides that are being shared will be posted along with the video in our uh, data equity community forum. And then while Dr. Burrell is presenting, if you have questions or comments, feel free to use the Zoom chat to uh, ask your questions. And we will get to those in a live Q&A session once uh, the slide presentation is done. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Burrell. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am really grateful. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me and foremost for the kind introduction. I really would like to share a little bit of what I know. And this is not only personal, but it's also professional for me. So my plan is to provide a little overview about who we are in the U.S., the heterogeneity with, within the population, talk a little bit about the Hispanic paradox, and then dive in into the terminology and the implication for health equity. So Hispanic or Latino population is the only ethnic group in the US. As we know, we are mandated to collect information on race and ethnicity based on two questions. The first one is the ethnicity question, and the second question is on race. We know we're going to talk about race, but very little in this presentation. So the question asks whether you are a person of Hispanic, Latino, or Hispanic origin. If you say yes, there are some specific uh, identifier, and if that doesn't fit with your identity, there is a blank space for you to fill out your identity. The whole idea behind ethnicity is about culture, norm, practices, behavior, in a way that sort of bring people together into a shared culture. For the Hispanic population, that glue is language. 
And that shared culture is very distinctive and it's passed between and across generations. And that creates a sense of identity. But of course, who, who we are, it is important at the individual level and at the aggregate level. In the census 2020, the Hispanic population became the largest minoritized group with a 62 million uh, individual in the US. As a group, it's usually seen as a homogeneous monolithic group. However, we are far from homogeneous. We, have, we are very heterogeneous in the context of where are we coming from, how we identify ourselves in the context of race, nativity status, US born versus a foreign born, and length in the US, generation, immigration patterns, you know everybody come through the same, the same doors, and socioeconomic position. We're going to talk a little about socioeconomic position because as we will see later, socioeconomic position doesn't have the same return for, his, for the Hispanic population. So this 62 million people come, although it's aggregate, come from at least 19 countries that they can identify as a single country with the large proportion coming from Mexico. 60, 62% of the Hispanic population is Mexican, whether it's um, foreign or US born. The second largest group is Puerto Rican and the rest are either aggregate or a smaller group. When it comes to the racial identification of the population, despite the fact that the OMB proposed that the, the um, ethnicity group could be or any, or any race or no race identification at all, we are also asked to answer the question of our race. And since 2000, the largest identification have been some of the race which is telling about how people identify themselves when it comes to, to race. As far as nativity status, one in three Hispanic is foreign born. They represent 44% of all the foreign born in the US. Three and four have been in the US for at least 10 years. And out of those, 43, 43, 44% are US citizen, whether born in the US or um, naturalized. And more than two thirds are English profession. This is a little lower, or much lower among foreign born, but there is 42.2% of foreign born that are English profession. So the Hispanic paradox, Hispanics share this minority status with the African-American and other groups, but the Hispanic health status is very distinct than the other groups. In fact, the Hispanic health status is very similar to the white population, despite the fact that they have lower socioeconomic status in the context of income and education and less access to her care. And this has been attributed to multiple explanations, cultural practice and norm, selective migration, the healthy, healthy migrant effect, the salmon bias that people go home and die when they get old, dietary factor, genetic heritage, social support, you name it. But this, this has been um, a pattern observed since data have been collected for Hispanic. And in fact, we can see that in some of the outcomes, such as infant mortality, you can see here that starting in 1980, 83, Hispanic and white are literally undistinguishable 
in this graph in the context of infant mortality, infant mortality pattern. Life expectancy, much, much higher than white. And even though when COVID hit, everybody thought that COVID was going to be an equalizer and that it wasn't going to discriminate by age, sex, gender, race, ethnicity, you name it. The group that were here the hardest were African-American and Hispanic because they were the one considered essential worker and were the one that didn't have the privilege to work remotely. So you can see here that despite the fact that Hispanic lost 4.1 year during, during the COVID pandemic, their life expectancy is still higher than whites. However, there are some issues and some limitation with this paradox. It's have been mostly a study among Mexican American, which is the largest group and the group that actually drive the statistics. And it has also been confirmed in some outcome, not all, infant mortality, adult mortality, and life expectancy. Here we can see, for example, low birth weight and infant mortality, two indicator of well-being or a population. And you can see that, and, and this is New York City data, that Hispanic are in between African-American and white. Now, the Hispanic population in New York City is very unique because it's more diverse than any, any place in the US. New York City have approximately 3 million of Hispanic and you can find here Hispanic from every country out of this 19, reported in the US census. And there are enclaves that sort of promote the Hispanic paradox in the context of social support and social network. However, we can see when we disaggregate the population that the Hispanic paradox doesn't apply to everyone. We know, for example, that Puerto Rican, despite the fact of being one of the groups, the longest in the US, have one of the worst health outcome. But very similar to African-American and the reason being because when they came to the US at the end of the 1800, they were placed in the same housing, housing and neighborhood in which African-American live. So a lot of the um, health outcome are very similar between black and white. Now, when it comes to the name, this is the part that you guys care about. We are not unfamiliar with naming. <laughs> Hispanic have been in the US since in the 1800s, starting with the Mexicans, from which in some day, we still hear about go home, despite the fact that some of that part of the, of the land used to belong to Mexico. So in, in, in 1930, they were called by the origin, then after by race. 1950, Puerto Rican were added to the census. 1960, Cubans. And each one of this group have a different immigration pattern in the US, whether it is privileged or unprivileged and that had implication for their health status over the year. In 1970 was the first time that a Spanish shell identifier was added to the census. And in 1976 was the first time that ethnicity was actually uh, put forward for collection of data in the US. And at, at, to that point, it was only Hispanic or Spanish origin. In 2000, the Latino identifier was added to the US census. 
And this is important because this, this is how people identify and how, how things have changed. So if you ask at the individual level how people like to be identified, it is likely that they tell you by their country of origin. Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, especially in places where you have diversity of the population. However, we do know that the, the, um, together we are stronger. So when you ask people how they prefer to identify themselves, the vast majority will tell you Hispanic. 61, 65% will say Hispanic. 21, 25 will say Latino. And these two terminology have been on and off in debate. Because when we talk about Hispanic, it sort of goes to the colonization and the history and tied to the language. When you talk about Latino, we talk about the whole Latin American and Caribbean, but then there are countries that doesn't speak the language and doesn't identify with the ethnic category. Brazil, Haiti, Belize, and other island in the Caribbean. Latinx was first introduced in the US in 2000, and really became popular after the uh, Pulse nightclub shooting in Florida in 2016. I myself heard the term, the term for the first time in 2017 in Spain. So most surveys show that approximately 23% of the population have here the term. And out of those, only 3% use it. And this has been consistent in 2015 to 2020. Different survey, different population. So as I say before, the term started in 2000 and have become popular after 2016, whether it's PC or the inclusion of whatever it is. And the whole idea of the term is to be inclusive when it comes to gender, especially for the non-binary identification. However, the term is a little bit problematic because it conflates sexual, gender, and ethnic identification. For example, if you ask anyone, are you Latinx? Ideally, you want to know how the person identifies before you ask that. And it has been shown that because, because it's so a small proportion of the population that have heard and used the term that it bothers and offends some people. It is also need to be underscored the fact that in the Spanish language, X doesn't have a pronunciation. So we don't use it as much. So when I tell my family, my older family or people my age, um, Latinx, they will look at me and say, what? What are you talking about? What is that? Because it is, it is hard for it. So I think one of the, in the context of data, which is what you care about, the, the issue that is important here is that whenever we collect data, we need to be accurate about who are we trying to represent. And at the end of the day, we collect data and present information because we want to eliminate health inequity. So if we start changing terminology, then what we create is that there is no pattern, no track, no consistency to monitor data. And I, I am a proponent that yes, if people identify as Latinx, that's fine. But the data should be explained, pilot tested, and have people identify with the term. 
My problem is when we use data that have been collected using other terminology, country of origin, Hispanic, Latino, and then is presented as Latinx. That's a problem because now we are, we are taking the identity of the participant and totally changing. No, mind you, that in most cases, the data have been collected for sex or gender separate than from ethnicity. So that's something that is very important. So just to close, we are far from homogeneous and that this need to be considered when we talk about the Hispanic population and any other population. And especially in the US, we have this idea that every group under a category is homogeneous, but it's, that's not true. Make no mistake about how people want to be na named or called. I think the best practice should be asking people how they prefer to be called or how they identify themselves. And second, if we collect data using a particular terminology, we should report it and interpret finding using that terminology, especially in the context of health equity. This is crucial. Otherwise, we start diluting the findings and making misrepresentation of the data. And with that, I will leave it there. And I, as Heather say, I will provide the slide. And if you have any question after this hour, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Burrell. I really, really appreciate your careful, thoughtful walking us through um, the work that you're doing and taking time from your uh, schedule to help us think through uh, how to handle this. And uh, like I mentioned, we will share Dr. Burrell's slides and also links to some of Dr. Burrell's work on this topic in the Data Equity Forum when we post the videos. And there are many, many questions in I the see. chat. Um, so before we read any of the questions um, from the chat, is there anybody in the room who wants to come off mute and ask their question out loud? Mm -hmm. oh. I have a question. Great, go ahead. Hi, this is Oak Slater in Colorado. I work on the Behavioral Respector Surveillance System. And last year, the CDC at the national level, um, New Mexico is already doing this, but the CDC approved for states to um, optionally add Hispanic hyphen to the race question, which comes after um, the basically the the format that you showed in the beginning, you know, um, are you Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and then breaks out those common categories, um, and then other Hispanic, Spanish origin. So anyone who says yes to that question when they receive the race question, which has its own issues as we know, but also um, you know normally would say white, African American, or black, um, etc., and doesn't have something anywhere similar to Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, normally in that question, but for anyone who would say yes to that Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin question previously, there the race question is read out loud differently, saying Hispanic white, Hispanic black or African-American, saying Hispanic in front of everything, including Hispanic, Asian, Hispanic Pacific Islander, et cetera. So in that way, um, you know, because in the, past, as you know, I'm sure with many surveys, folks would say, just not hear themselves on the list, say, I'm other, I'm not, I just told you, or different things. Um, and it was the highest group that had other, basically, um, with the write-in that would be put in. And so I just want to know your thoughts about that effort, 
to include and how valuable you think that would be or other alternatives that might be better since I know the CDC is usually behind and its efforts to be inclusive aren't necessarily following best practice in the moment. So I actually wrote a editorial in 2005 about this, about the racial identification of the Latino population. And I actually tested empirical, I wrote a couple of paper. So it's nothing wrong with how we identify ourselves. I can be a Hispanic black. The problem is how others see us and the opportunity that come with that. I do feel that the more granularity we have in the data, the better we are. And there is evidence that show that Hispanic white do much, much better than Hispanic that identify as older and as black. So if, if the numbers are there, test, compare. But in most cases, you don't have a lot of um, distinction within the Hispanic population because most, most of them tend to identify this with some other race category or with white. <clears throat> But if you have data in Hispanic and, and race, and you can cross tabulate it and see the health outcome of the different groups, please do it. I, I, I think you'll be surprised. Hello, this is Alfonso Rodriguez. You. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, from the CDC. I was following up your, your comment, uh, Dr. Aparoyal. Uh, I totally agree in terms of the disaggregated Hispanic, you know, information has been recommended for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And it's still, we are really behind on that. But I also add that two other critical variables I will, has been recommended are country of birth. You know, like you said, born and foreign born versus US born, because the health indicators for Hispanic born in the US and Hispanic born in, in their countries of origin is extremely different. So similarity mm -hmm. in, in terms of lack of access to healthcare, but many, many other differences and also in, you know, immigration status, language. Uh, so I think that's, uh, and, and actually most of the Latino paradox, I believe is, is being proven to be due to the immigrants and not to the Latinos born, unfortunately, uh, in the US. So that would be one. And the, and the other two variables of nativity and also language, because most Latinos are born in the US, meaning the race in the US, more likely English is their first language. Mm -hmm. They may speak Spanish with different fluency. So language we know is an important determinant of, uh, you know, health. And, uh, uh, and and so those are the two additional that can complement that is segregated data. And just one more final thing is, in at the end of the day, I've seen a number of comments about if you're indigenous, are you Latino? If you're Brazilian, are you Latino? At the end of the day, all of our surveys are supposed to be self-identification and don't provide any definition. They don't say if you were born in, if you speak X or Y, please check the Hispanic. It only asks, are you Hispanic or Latino? So basically people, when they read this, they use their own criteria based on whatever it is, mm -hmm. my ancestors, my, my whatever it is, and they say yes or no. So uh, it's a lot of, uh, you know, we cannot tell people you are this or you are that because you speak Spanish, you are Latino. That's, that, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. I Thank you agree, so much. I cannot agree with you more in, in nativity and language. And it's interesting that you mentioned language because they have been shown recently that people that speak both language actually do better in health. So that by cultural assimilation sort of help navigate and maybe a buffer for health outcome. That's a very interesting point that it's, uh, it depends on what we're trying to measure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what is going on a lot in the chat. Are, are, are we trying to measure uh, an administrative category to which someone belongs? Are we trying to measure someone's identity? Are we trying to measure their language? Are we trying to measure their in indigeneity, the combination of their heritage? Um, I want to get, we have lots of people with their hands up. Thank you for putting your hands up. I really appreciate it. It's the only way we can manage um, a few hundred people on a Zoom meeting. Tony, thank you for waiting. 
Hi, uh, thank you for speaking. Um, so the office uh, for the US Office of Ma Management and Budget is um, reviewing federal uh, standards for race and ethnicity. Um, by the way, y'all, if you're in the US, you can give input, I think, until April 12th for that. Um, I'm curious, like, how would you recommend, what recommendations would you have for, for improving this data and, and how the US collects it? Because the, the census tends to be what sets the, the tone for a lot of this, or at least for, for for myself and state government, that tends to be our big data source. Like, how would you recommend we improve this to be um, more inclusive or, or more effective in, in gathering the data? To be more, more granular, to allow people to identify as, as much as they can. Like with the 2020, we saw that African-American and white were able to identify their ancestry. We should do that with every single group. And I, I think that will be the best. Ideally, in an ideal world, it would be good to get, get a rate of race and ethnicity. However, we don't live in a colorblind society, unfortunately. That's a great point um, about adding granularity. And Tony, we will try and find a link to the place to put input uh, so that people who are here uh, and live or work in the US uh, can do that. That is a great suggestion. Um, thank you so much for your question. Go ahead, Veronica. I know you've been waiting a long time. Thank you. No, thanks. Um, this was really informative. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious uh, about maybe your insight into like Latinos um, identifying um, as indigenous in for a race, um, because there is a big movement to do that. Um, but sometimes like, if depending on what forms you're filling out, like does it infringe on kind of like the, tri the official tribes here in the US? Like you also don't want to kind of start um, muddying the waters in that sense. Like how do you do it where it's still mindful? Um, any insight on kind of that movement? So this is also common with the Afro-Latino movement. And I feel that it's about people feeling marginalized and iso isolated. So we need to create categories that provide visibility to those groups because their health outcome and their voices in general are being lost under the broad umbrella of the Hispanic category. But aside from just giving visibility, it's about providing the venue for the culture that these people bring to the table and how that either influence or affect their health outcome. And I think we, we are still doing baby step about recognizing all the heterogeneity within the different categories. I agree, that's, that's um, there's such a variety within the culture that having this broad term is just, um, it, I really do, uh, you know, feel like it's it's kind of a, a whitewashing mm -hmm. term of a, an enormous and varied group. It's, it's a way to to simplify things. Everybody is in one category, and the assumption when we do a statistics is that everybody that is in a category is homogeneous. They have the same characteristic, and that's far from reality, regardless of the group that you look at. Go ahead, Marcella. Um, thank you, um, Luisa, for, <clears throat> for bringing this up. I have uh, two issues. The first one has to do with the race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I'm from Argentina originally. I've been in the US for 40 years. Never had to answer a question about my race or ethnicity before I came to this country. And when I did, <laughs> I struggled with, uh, I'm assuming I'm white. 
But a lot of people from my country who are, you know, phenotypically maybe not white and have black ancestry were never asked that question, would probably never, don't even know that they may have black ancestry and would check white. A lot of people in Latin America would check white, even though genetically, maybe they, they have a more mixed uh, background. And so that's already misleading. Uh, and the second question is, I have two kids. My husband is American and would definitely identify as, um, you know, uh, white, doesn't speak Spanish. One of my kids checks Hispanic, the other one does not. So uh, one speaks very good Spanish, the oldest, the second one, you know, has adopted it later. And, you know, so what does that do to your census? <laughs> it doesn't do anything. At the end of the day, this is all self-reported on how, how people identify themselves. So you, you happen to have a um, sense of identification in your family that is completely uh, different for everybody. And I think that happened in every um, immigrant family in the US. I have nephews and nieces that have never even been in the Dominican Republic, but they identify as Dominican. There right. are others that they don't, they don't identify as Dominican. And I come from a family unlike you, that is a rainbow in the context mm -hmm. of color. And that we thought about color in DR? Yes, we do, we do, but we do know that socioeconomic status trump the color of the yes. skin in the Caribbean. Exactly. And that's something that we need to be very clear about it. We do see color, but we also see dollars or, or peso, yes. whatever is the, the coin. So I think we have to be very clear as Hispanic and, and, and be honest with ourselves about that. We do, we do have some racism in our countries, but we don't talk about it because socioeconomic status is more important. But Luisa, this would have an impact when you talk about health. You know, because when you're saying, oh, Cuban, you know, Hispanics are, you know, cu white Cubans do better than black Cubans. But in fact, you know, probably if you looked at, it, at them genetically, you would have a lot more people with black ancestry than you would white. And you're making comparisons, assuming that who says his white is white and who says they're black, they're black and their health outcomes are different. So how does that affect the data when it comes to these kinds of comparisons, when it's self-reporting? It all depends on the outcome and the data that is being collected. Right now, there is a big push for genetic ancestry. And no genetic ancestry in the context of gen genealogical ancestry, but genetic similarity. As you mentioned, in the Caribbean is, is uh, the, the Hispanic population as a whole is the most at mixed population in the world. You take 30 or 40 Puerto Rican or Mexican and the diversity in the, in the proportion of African ancestry, Native American ancestry, European ancestry is going to be huge. So when, if we really are interested in patterns of disease that are genetically driven, we need to go beyond than cell identification. Cell identification is not going to help us with that. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. This is a, a really critical topic. One of the follow-up questions I'm going to lift up from the chat is a few times we've said, or we've heard, one of the things we need to do is kind of ask the people that we're collecting data from. Obviously, if we're, you know, talking about census data, that's, that's a little bit different, but let's say we're doing local community health research and we want to try and be respectful of the names and labels that we use locally. Um, do you have recommendations on, or even experience on how, how to ask a local population, a local group of people, what they would prefer? Focus group. 
focus group, talk about identity, how people identify, how they identify themselves, how they prefer, what? or how, how they in the community, what is uh -huh. the, the, common, the common language when it comes to identity. Do you think there's any value, and there may not be, in asking a, a survey question that simply gives some of the terms that we're talking about here and asks people which they identify as? Absolutely. I feel that every survey, including the national survey, should provide mm. the OMB categories and also provide an open question, mm. how you identify yourself. And I think that will be extremely informative in the context mm -hmm. of health. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Because yeah. as um, Jose, Jose Alfonso Rodriguez mentioned, identity is also tied to language and nativity status. Right. When people come to this country, their sense of identity is very different than when they have been here 10, 15 years and they have been hit with the census or with questions over and over. So it becomes like a hot run effect. What did you expect me to say? I'm black, I'm Hispanic. Right. And so in some ways asking questions in a certain way is perpetuating the very marginalization that we sometimes claim to be trying to improve or move the needle on. Yeah, that the act of creating these boxes creates these mental separations. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are so many questions in the chat. <laughs> Do you know, and, and I don't know, this might be, oh, I want to say that a lot of people are asking, um, are there citations we can use to support the recommendation to make sure that we report the data in the way it's collecting? And uh, Dr. Burrell has a very good reference on that, that um, they've written, and we will link that. But uh, mm -hmm. it's very interesting, your work in how frequently the labels that were used in data collection and the labels that are used in reporting are not the same labels, right? Absolutely. It's funny <laughs> that I got into this work when I was in graduate school because someone asked me if I was Mexican. And in, coming from New York, I. I I came and I live all my life in New York. So New York, as I mentioned before, is a, is a place that you really have granularity when it comes to the Hispanic population because I live in a neighborhood that I can walk around and I can find an Equatorian, a Bolivian, Colombian, you name it. And I went to Michigan for graduate school and I was in a meeting one time and someone asked me, are you Mexican? because that's the only exposure they have there with the, the um, in, in Detroit. And I was like, OMG, these people have no clue about the diversity within right. the people and the physical characteristic or, or the whole gamut of variation that is within the population. So I, I got very interested in, in that and the health outcome, identity, and started to talk to friends, to um, my family, everyone. I used to ask them, how did you, after you've been here, how did you identify yourself? And people say, well, it had changed since I came here, and it depends on the day you ask me. Yeah, exactly. So important. Uh, and, and that's true for any <laughs> sociodemographic data that we're collecting. <laughs> uh, when we ask sociodemographic questions, we are perpetuating whatever mm -hmm. labels and names we are asking. Um, so one of the questions that's being asked a couple of times, and I, I don't know if this is in your area of expertise, is do you know where the term Latinx came from, where it started? I'm sure there's a few different ideas, right? I don't know exactly where it originated, but I know it started to float around in 2000. I particularly hear it the first time in Spain in 2017. 
Okay. Uh, in, did you say in Spain? That's yeah, in Madrid. I, I, I was shocked. I was like, especially here because X doesn't really have a, a mm -hmm. pronunciation within the language, but they seem to, I guess they try to be political correct or something. That's interesting. And there are a few people who are putting links into the chat, somebody from Australia, somebody from can country where I live, Canada, are putting examples into the chat about how different it is. Like we should say that almost all of the conversation we've had today here is related to how this data is being collected and used mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the United States and um, the way that they do it in almost every other country is different. And Literally. um not better, but just different. Like I think the census that had more similarity with the US is the Brazil census. And oh, even really? there, they have an open question. In 2010, there were like 240, 245 identifier in addition to the identifier that the census mm -hmm. provided. So people they were able to to self-identify as their everyday. The mm -hmm. other issue that is important here is the distinction between self-identification and the street race. How people see you. Uh -huh. Because that's the one that is going to affect opportunities, discrimination, you name it. Right. And it's a lot of work going into a street race this day. Yes, there is a lot of work going into street race. And we've talked about it a few times uh, with different people over our, our Fridays. And there's a lot of controversy about it because of course it seems really important because what you're saying, you know, how a person is viewed by others in terms of their experience of racism, marginalization, oppression is unfortunately still important but how will a person know how they're viewed by others and do you, what do you think about that so you can ask someone like if you ask me how i identify myself and how i think other people see me mm -hmm. i can tell you i identify myself as dominican hispanic but i know that if i don't open my mouth and Mm -hmm. Just by looking at my, at my last name, it's not a, a, a common Spanish last name. A lot of people think that I'm Black. I'm Black Caribbean. Okay, right. And what do you think, circling back to what somebody else shared earlier about asking like a young person, are, are, at what point are we perpetuating racism by asking people if they're experiencing racism when they're young because there's pros and cons I mean Absolutely. there's deaf yeah what do you think uh, I think kids know already we had yeah. done a study in asthma uh, at mm -hmm. eight years old and we've seen that those kids that report that they feel discriminated they are more likely to have an asthma attack really so they know it's, it, the thing is that race and ethnicity is something that is in the DNA of the U.S. society. It's basically a made in the U.S. thing. Yeah, right. Oh, that's fascinating. We will, yes, to people asking <laughs> for to see the asthma survey, we will do our best uh, to get that asthma um, report. I can send you the paper, yeah. <laughs> your papers are going to get lots and lots of citations after this from, from your accounts. Okay, we we have about two more minutes before uh, we need to uh, wrap it up and let people get lunch or um, have an initial conversation. I was going to say, does anybody want to be the last question? So go ahead, Karina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Aborel. Um, I have a question that I put in the chat, but I'm just going to read it out loud. How important is to consider intersectionality when evaluating health outcomes or educational outcomes? Um, I would like to hear your thoughts. Amen. Amen. We should be doing this because there are interlocking systems of oppression, your age, your gender, your identity. 
those are powerful identities that unfortunately we tend to look at them separate, but it's not the same to look at a 20 year old black female than if you put the three, the intersectionality of the three identity together. So a lot of work is being done right now into intersectionality with my colleague Lisa Bogley and also in health disparity. It's a new technique called MIDA. Uh, Claire Evans proposed that in which they are looking at system of interse intersectionality using multi-level analysis to tease out health disparity, health inequity. And some of the issues that are being, um, the factors that are being looked is age, gender, sex, race and ethnicity, education, and how those factor together create a strata that actually affect individual, independent of their individual characteristic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for that question and all the questions and um, Dr. Brell for coming and sharing your work about um, how to grapple with this very, very complicated question about how do we use quantitative analysis, which is designed to put people into groups, right? Like it's different if we're doing qualitative analysis and is there a way for this particular group or many groups of people, how can we collect data that's meaningful, that can help us move the needle <laughs> on equity, on disparity without perpetuating racism, perpetuating false silos of humans? And there is absolutely not a simple answer, not an easy answer, especially when the tools are built to replicate the very problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so I, one of the things I really love <laughs> about the community of people that come together on Fridays is that we all kind of do understand that there isn't a single answer and we were trying to chunk this out kind of one hour at a time, one little tiny piece of very big complicated issue. Um, and there are lots of related topics and disparities and oppression um, vectors that relate to the topic that we dove into today that we didn't have a chance to talk about and do a deep dive in today. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean they're not really important and valuable. Um, and so thank you so much for continuing to um, work at this in, in bite-sized pieces, one Friday at a time. And um, I really appreciate the innovation and the commitment to kind of figuring out practical ways through thorny issues that this group has that you bring every single Friday. Um, I know that we've generated lots <laughs> of ideas and um, we will put this video along with um, the resources that we mentioned in the community forum. And uh, there are lots of spaces in the community forum to bring up conversations and additional questions and feel free to do that. It is not a paid membership site. You don't have to, um, you know, spend money to have an opinion in the data equity community forum. You can express your opinion and um, have productive conversations. And uh, we really encourage you to do that because it's going to take a lot of people from a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different lived experiences to figure this out. Um, next week, we will be back. We have uh, an expert on sampling. So we're, we, some of you have requested to talk about sampling. Sampling is like a, a, how to collect data when you can't ask every single person in your whole community uh, a question. And this person uh, has some practical expertise that they're gonna share in um, a low technical requirement way <laughs> next week. So that's our topic next Friday. And Dr. Burrell, I am so grateful that you took the time uh, to share with us your expertise and your, your thoughtfulness and your generosity. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, I truly enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. 
So we will leave it there and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. Take care.